All right, so in this video, we're going to go over the inverse function theorem. Um, so the inverse function theorem explains how the derivative of a function and its inverse are related. Okay? Um, now, there, there's a lot of technical assumptions which you're probably not going to necessarily need to remember for, for the practical problems that you're going to be working on. Um, all you really need is the conclusion of this theorem, which we haven't gotten to yet. It's not there on the board. All right. Um, now, it turns out some of these conditions are, are redundant, but we don't have the tools to, to argue for that yet. Um, if, if your function is differentiable and the derivative is non-zero, it turns out that your function will automatically be one to one. Um, and and um, you know, a very careful, rigorous statement of the inverse function theorem and the corresponding proof is actually quite technically difficult um, if you want to make this as general as possible. Um, but if you're, if you're willing to just kind of make an assumption that the inverse is differentiable, um, there's a lot you can do. Uh, the general inverse function theorem will actually guarantee the differentiability here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to show, well, if you knew that it was differentiable, what would the derivative look like? That's what we're going to do, right? We're not going to try to prove that it has to be differentiable, but turns out it does. It, it will exist. Um, but before we do, let's consider um, a slight generalization of the example we just looked at. Let's look at a linear function f of x is mx plus b, where m is, is non-zero, okay? So remember that we can think things through here and we can come up with the inverse, right? Um, so what does this function do? Well, first it multiplies by m, then it adds b. Um, so if we wanted to get the inverse of that, we want to undo things that we have to undo in the opposite order. So Last thing we did was add b. So the first thing we do here is subtract b. Then we undo the multiplication. We undo that with the division. Okay? So we could write this as 1 over m times x minus b over m. And feel free to sit down and confirm that these are indeed inverses of each other. Remember that one way you can do that is you can compose the two functions and, and see that um, you get back to where you started. You always just get x out when you compose them. Okay? So we can, we can do that. All right. Um, you can also do things like if you just take f of x and you plug it in here, right? Uh, mx plus b. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work out for you, right? The mx, the plus b will cancel with the minus b, divide by m, get back to x. Yeah, so you can confirm that it works. Uh, but the, the, the important thing here, what I want you to notice, is notice that you have reciprocal slopes, right? The, the slope for the inverse of a linear function is, is 1 over the slope of the original linear function. And if you think about derivatives, well, we know that um, derivatives allow us to make these tangent line approximations to the graph of some function, right? So locally, we can approximate by a linear function, and we should expect the same sort of reciprocal relationship between the slopes, right? So we should expect that the slope of the tangent line for the inverse should be 1 over the slope of the tangent line for the original function if we're evaluating at the appropriate points, right? And that's exactly what the inverse function theorem says. It says if f of a equals b, then this g, which is the inverse, so g prime at b will be 1 over f prime at a. Okay? That's what the inverse function theorem says. Another way that you might see this stated is you might see it like this. You might see it stated as f inverse prime at x is 1 over f prime of, well, we kind of want to put a y in here, but uh, y is going to be f inverse of x. 
So 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. Okay? That's, the, um, that's the formula that you usually see for the inverse function theorem in one variable. Uh, if you want to see a quick example of this, let's say f of x is the exponential function, right? So the inverse is the natural log. Now, let's say we worked out from the definition of the derivative, as, as we in fact did, uh, we worked out from the definition of the derivative that the derivative of the exponential function is itself. Um, we had to make one leap of faith and, and assume that, that this natural exponential base e is defined in such a way that the derivative at 0 is 1 and so on. But anyway, so assume we know that f prime of x is e to the x, right? Um, a few um, you know, sections back when we were doing the videos for, for the basic derivative rules, uh, I asked you to sort of take it on faith that the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x, right? But we gave zero justification for this. How do we actually show that this is true? Well, let's see. So the derivative, f inverse prime, so the derivative of the natural log, according to this rule, should be 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. Okay? But f prime is just e to the x, and f inverse of x is the natural log of x, and we know that these are inverses of each other. We know that they cancel out. e to the log of x is just x. Okay? There's our 1 over x, as we've been assuming all along. Now we can see that, in fact, yes, that is the correct rule. Okay? Um, if you're wondering how you, how you establish this as fact, um, if you let y equal f inverse of x, right, and we'll, we'll use this technique in a, in a few examples to come. If y is equal to f inverse of x, we know that that's the same thing as saying f of y is equal to x. Now you can take the derivative of both sides using implicit differentiation, right? So f prime of y times y prime is the derivative of x, which is just 1. So solving for y prime, y prime is 1 over f prime of y, which is 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. Right? Um, so it's a simple exercise in implicit differentiation to come up with this formula. The only catch is you sort of have to know in advance that that derivative actually exists in order to, uh, in order to do the implicit differentiation. Okay? Um, so next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at inverse trig functions.